Well, folks, I'm going to configure a new board, and uh, I did a video about my pre-maiden configuration and checklist. Uh, I did it some time ago, and maybe a little out of date. I'm going to do another one this time with Betaflight 290. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to flash the firmware to the board. Now, I do want to let you know that I'm skipping a step here. You need to have the, um, I don't know which of these three you need, because I have, it's been so long since I installed them all that uh, some boards don't use the VCP drivers, for example, although this board does use the VCP drivers. Uh, some boards use the CP210 drivers and then the Zadig drivers for DFU flashing. If you have not installed these three things and you're just now getting into clean flight and beta flight, go ahead, get these installed. I have instructions for doing this in my video on the Luminaire Lux uh, flight controller, which I will link to in the upper right, unless I forget to do it like I often do, in which case you'll remind me in the comments. So these three are done, and we're going to skip that step in this video. So I'm going to go to the firmware flasher, and uh, I'm going to have no reboot sequence, flash unconnect, and full chip erase. That's what you need for this board. On some boards, you also need manual baud rate, like the X-Racer F303 requires a manual baud rate. This one does not. And I'm going to choose the board, which is basically which target we're using. Uh, the target for this board is Doge. Uh, and the firmware version I'm going to put on is 2.9.0. So I'm going to click load firmware to get that loaded up. And now that it's loaded, I'm going to hold down the bootloader button on the board. And I'm going to plug the board into USB. And it should flash automatically here. My experience, it sometimes does not. It depends on various factors. So I'm just going to hit flash firmware. And there you go, bingo. Done. Successful. Now I'm going to unplug the board. Oh, there. It tried to flash. I don't know if you saw that. It tried to flash right there, but it didn't work. I'm going to go to the welcome screen. I'm going to plug the board in, this time without the bootloader button. And I'm going to connect. And go. There we go. We have a clean, fresh install of Betaflight 290 that we can begin configuring. The first thing I want to do is I want to set up my ports. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I need MSP. MSP is the protocol that is used to talk to the configurator GUI that we're using. So you must have MSP turned on. In this case, the VCP, the virtual COM port, is the port that's being used. So we don't need to have it on the UART. We're not using the UART. If your board has a virtual COM port, that's what you're going to be using for MSP. If your board does not have a virtual COM port, usually it's UART 1 that is attached to the USB that's used for MSP. In this case, it is safe for me to turn MSP off on UART 1 because I have the virtual COM port. The reason that this board ships with UART 1 configured with MSP is that this board is designed to use the OS Doge uh, OSD, and the OS Doge will talk MSP as well to the board via, via UART 1. We're not going to do that because I use the Red Rotor R OSD, so I don't need MSP here. I'm going to turn that off. UART 3 on this board is used for the serial receiver, so I've got that wired up, and I'm going to turn that on. And I like to use UART 2 for uh, smart port telemetry. If I was going to use an open log device, I would use UART 1. And the beautiful thing is that because this board has VCP, I would not need to share black box open log with the USB port. They could, they could operate at the same time and not get in each other's way. That's nice. So I'm going to save this. The board will reboot. And I, I'm not sure why sometimes I need to manually disconnect and reconnect and other times I don't, but hey, there you go. That's one of the quirks of using the virtual COM port VCP. Sometimes a computer doesn't always seem to let the configurator know that the board has disconnected and reconnected. Next, I'll go to the configuration tab and I'm gonna configure my receiver. Now again, I'm using a serial receiver. If you were not using a serial receiver, you would not need to do this step. You would just leave, you just skip that. But I'm using a serial receiver, so I'm gonna choose RX serial, and SBUS, which is the protocol I'm using, and I will save and reboot. And I'm going to manually disconnect, reconnect again. It seems to have taken. Yes. And the next thing I'll do is I'll go to the receiver tab. Thank you, Tyrannus. And I'll see that my Tyrannus is working correctly. And I can see my throttle channel is correct. I'm going to check my sticks and my and my mapping. Throttle is correct. Yaw, uh, so, so my mapping is not correct. I'm right now moving the roll stick, but yaw is moving. That's not right. And roll pitch, pitch is correct. Roll is moving yaw, and yaw is moving roll. So I need to switch 
yaw and roll, but everything else is correct. So let's see, that's A and R. I have A E T R in the channel map. I need to switch roll and R E T A. Rudder and aileron is what it's doing there. R E T A, one, two, three, four is the correct mapping for my transmitter. I'm going to save that. And let's see that, that that took. So here's roll, correct. Yaw, correct. Pitch, or rather throttle and pitch, correct. The next thing I need to do is I need to check my endpoints on my transmitter. Your endpoints must be 1,000 to 2,000. So 1,000 to 2,000. I'm going to do that for every channel. Throttle 1,000 to 2,000. Roll 1,000, uh, not quite, to 2,000. Yeah, so let's check the roll. Uh, there we go. My gimbals are getting a little janky. Uh, Tyrannus has got some dust in the gimbals, I guess. There you go. Uh, pitch 2,000 to 1,000. All good. And then finally, I want all my channels to center at 1500. And you can see that they're not quite centering at 1500. And that again is my, my Tyrannus is a few years old and it's got some dust in it. And, uh, and so I, I, I trimmed this out to 1500, but it, it kind of has a little trouble holding center. So there you go. You guys who want to criticize Tyrannus gimbals, this is your, your opportunity to do that. Okay. So now my channels are correct. What should you do if your channels cannot go 1,000 to 2,000? You can use the RX range command here to adjust the expected endpoint of those four channels. Now the, you see the default is 1,000 to 2,000, but you could modify it. Okay, so we're not going to need to do that because the Tyrannus is capable of... But we're not going to need to do that because the Tyrannus is capable of hitting those endpoints. Okay, fine. The receiver is working correctly. Channels are mapped correctly. Very good. In the configuration, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check my VBAT scale and I'm going to compare the voltage that is being reported. I'm going to need to plug in a LiPo to do this. I'm going to compare the voltage that is being reported here with the voltage on a battery checker or a multimeter and I'm going to adjust the voltage scale up or down to get that correct. The other thing I do is I set my maximum voltage to 4.4, and the reason for that is that I run high volts sometimes, which go up to 4.35 per cell, so if 4.3 was the limit, then the maximum would, would trigger, and I don't want that. And we've got the gyro update frequency and the PID loop frequency, which uh, I've got a whole other video on how to set those, which I'll link to in the upper right. So I'm going to run the gyro update as fast as possible, which is the guideline I give. And then since I'm running one shot, I don't want to, these ESCs are one shot ESCs and I haven't flashed them to multi-shot. And I'm probably not going to because I'm lazy. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and run two kilohertz for the PID loop. And I'm also going to make sure that accelerometer, barometer, and magnetometer are disabled because I don't fly auto level. So I don't need accelerometer. This board doesn't even have a barometer or a magnetometer. Let's save and reboot. And I'll need to disconnect to reconnect. Thank you, virtual COM port. I, I use uh, telemetry, so I'm going to turn telemetry on. I often use black box, although I'm not using it on this machine. And I like to turn air mode on because I always want air mode enabled. One thing that I absolutely must not forget to do is to set my board alignment. In this case, my board is actually facing backwards because of a wiring issue I needed to solve. And so I'm going to set my yaw board align to 180 to tell a clean flight that the board is facing backwards. The other thing I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and enable the accelerometer, and you'll see why in a minute. Now you can see my accelerometer is working. I'll just check the configuration that has taken the 180 yaw degrees. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Setup tab, and I'm going to check that roll left, roll right, pitch forward, pitch back. And that's my indicator that the board align is correct. If roll and pitch are both correct on the 3D model, then that tells me that my board align is also correct. Great. So now I'm going to disable the accelerometer again and save and reboot. Failsafe is the next thing to set up. It's very, very important that failsafe be set up correctly. Uh, for the time being, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of details on how to configure it and what all of this means. But for now, suffice it to say that I like to use a guard time of, let's say, a half a second. 
and I like to drop the copter, just drop it, when the copter uh, goes into failsafe. And that's that. Failsafe stage 2 enabled. Drop the copter when failsafe goes into stage 2. On the PID tuning tab, of course, now I'm not going to be PID tuning anything uh, because I, that's what I'm going to do in the field, but I am going to set my derivative method to error. I like to use the error derivative. I've got another video on error versus measurement. You can choose for yourself. Because this is an F3 board, I am going to use floating point math. If this was an F1 board, I would choose integer math. I'm going to leave super expo rates on because for the time being, I'm experimenting with super expo rates. And I'm going to input the rates that I've determined uh, to be what I think I'd like. I'm still figuring out whether these rates are correct, but once you know what your rates are, I think I like to enter them into every copter as a good starting point. So 1.39, 0 0.70, and 0 expo. So let's save that. Boris, Boris has suggested that we start with 0 expo and just, just try to figure it out with just RC rate and rate. So my rates are in. I'm going to leave these filters at the default setting clean. No, and I'm only going to reduce these filters if I feel like I need more filtering or if I've got particularly noisy motors or props. In the modes tab, I'm going to set up an arming mode. I arm uh, with, with aux1 and I have aux1 low for arming. Let's just confirm that. There we go. Arming, disarm. Great. And we'll save that. And I have a beeper, which is aux3 in the middle. Great. Save that. And that's it. That's all I do there. Uh, on some of my copters, I'll also set up a black box mode, but I'm not using black box on this copter. If this were a copter where I was using black box, I would configure the black box here. I have another video on black box configuration, which I'll link you to in the upper right. And that's about it. Hey, Joshua from the future here with a quick update. That is not about it. I missed one thing, one very important thing that I forgot to mention. And that is that I will always go and I will modify my min check and my max check because that gets rid of the dead band at the bottom of the throttle stick, which is pretty important. So normally min check defaults to something like 1100. It depends on which version of software you're running. And that means that you'll have 100 microseconds of dead band at the bottom of your throttle between 1000, which is the actual bottom of the throttle range, and 1100, which is where uh, the, the dead band ends. And the purpose of that dead band is to allow you to enter stick commands, specifically the disarm stick command. If you're using throttle down and yaw left to disarm, you wouldn't be able to do that without making your copter spin crazy pirouettes. So the min check puts a dead band at the bottom of the throttle channel between min check and the actual bottom of the channel which is kind of annoying if you're trying to fly and there's this little dead band at the bottom of your throttle. By changing min check to a lower value, you can get rid of that. Min check defaults to 1100 or something like it, but most modern transmitters uh, you know, of reasonable quality are capable of consistently hitting 1000 microseconds and they just don't need that much dead band. If you know that your transmitter can hit 1000 microseconds consistently, you can set your dead band to something as, as uh, even 1005, give you five microseconds of dead band it's more than enough. If you have a transmitter, a, a cheaper transmitter, no shame in that. If you can't consistently hit 1,000 microseconds, you may need a higher min check value in order to, for you to let your copter arm. The copter will not arm unless the throttle is below min check. So I've got to go back and I got to modify my min check to 1005. And I also like to modify my max check to 1995 just for symmetry, although there actually isn't any practical effect of modifying max check because there's no dead band at the top of the throttle channel. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If there's anything you think I overlooked or if there's anything on your builds that you uh, wonder about that I'm not doing for whatever reason, go ahead and ask in the comments. I'll be happy to help you out. And as always, happy flying.